the judgment that Catholics who sincerely cannot follow the encyclical's teaching are not thereby separated from the love of God. Such themes were sounded by the bishops of Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, France, Canada, and the Scandinavian countries. My own favorite excerpt from these bishops who supported the primacy of individual conscience doctrine comes from the Scandinavian bishops whom I shall now pro proceed to quote. No one, including the church, can absolve anyone from the obligation to follow his or her conscience. If someone, for weighty and well-considered reasons, cannot be convinced of the argumentation of the encyclical, it has always been conceded that he or she is allowed to have a different view from that presented in a non-infallible statement of the church. No one should be considered a bad Catholic because he or she is of such a dissenting opinion. Allow me to emphasize the 1971 statement by the US, by the US Sacred Congregation for the Clergy over the signature of its cardinal as follows, and I quote, conscience is inviolable and no person is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his or her conscience, as the moral tradition of the church attests. Thus, in pastoral practice, priests must not be too quick to assume either complete innocence or moral guilt in the persons they counsel. One must recognize persons who are, quote, honestly trying to lead a good Christian life, unquote. There must be confidence in the mercy of God and the forgiving power of Christ. In 1994, a volume called The New Dictionary of Catholic so Social Thought took note of the progress of liberal progressive Catholic thinking by analyzing the major modern encyclicals and reaching the following conclusion, quote, the Catholic Church in its official pronouncement at least continues today to affirm that natural family planning and sexual abstinence are the only morally acceptable means of controlling birth. What has become the key issue for Catholic thought in the matter of birth control, therefore, is not the intended ends sought by proponents of artificial birth control, but the morally legitimate means to the admittedly good ends that birth control advocates claim to seek and the human values that will be used or distorted in using morally illegitimate means. There seems to be several major concerns behind the continued opposition of Catholic social teaching to the practice of artificial means of birth control, be those means mechanical. For example, condoms, IUDs, diaphragms, cervical caps, chemical, for example, spermicidal agents, the pill, or surgical, for example, sterilization, abortion. These concerns focus on the dignity of man and woman, the well-being of children and families, and God's role in the creation of new life. The book, Christ Among Us, which has been described as America's most popular guide to modern Catholicism, describes the ongoing process of reformulating Catholic doctrine. And I quote, in this matter, as in anything, the church has not spoken the final word, and the development of its teaching is quite possible in the future. The large majority of theologians agree that no question of infallibility is involved. Soon after the encyclical, 500 American theologians, in concert with many throughout the world, asserted that for grave reasons, Catholics may follow their conscience of this matter, even though the Pope has spoken. The large majority of Catholic couples have been unable to square this teaching with their consciences. Priest sociologist Andrew Greeley estimates that nine out of 10 Catholic couples practice contraception at some time during their childbearing years. These couples may be respectful of the church's duty to teach in moral matters or trying to live good Christian married lives and are willing to practice self-denial. They have tried to inform their consciences as best they can and feel that for serious physical, financial, or psychological reasons, they cannot choose periodic abstinence. Their consciences tell them that another child at this time would cause great damage to their married life and perhaps to the children they already had. And for some, contraception presents itself as the only alternative to a possible abortion, which is obviously a far greater evil. As we have seen, it is clear teaching that 
While erroneous doctrines might be made in following one's conscience, one who has tried to inform one's conscience as best as one can must then follow it. If a Catholic disagrees with the moral teaching of the church, according to an eminent theologian, we must take into account the following principles. Bullet. If, after proper study, reflection, and prayer, a person is convinced that his or her conscience is correct, in spite of a conflict with the moral teachings of the church, the person may, the person not only may, but must follow the dictates of conscience rather than the teachings of the church. Bullet, the church has never explicitly claimed to speak infallibly on a moral question. Bullet, no teaching of the church can hope to account for every moral situation and circumstance. Bullet, no teaching of the church. Bullet, the teachings themselves are histori historically conditioned. What may have been perceived as morally wrong in one set of circumstances would be regarded as morally justifiable in another situation. Bullet, no individual or groups of individuals can hope to identify and grasp moral truth by relying entirely on our own resources. We are all finite and sinful. Let me end this overview on the primacy of conscience doctrine with an excerpt from a 2010 book which lists four grounds for artificial contraception. One, population explosion is a major issue. It is irresponsible to encourage large families, especially in the so-called developing world, which I would like to humbly submit is a term that is often used for the world's poorest countries, thus masking the fact that some nations are growing even poorer. Number two, responsible stewardship requires adults to plan their families according to their means, their preferences, and their health. Three, sexual intimacy within marriage is good in itself. The fact that it need no longer be linked with the possibility of conception is to be welcomed with thanksgiving. Four, HIV AIDS is an immense problem. Its spread is more likely to be stemmed by widespread use of condoms than by unreal unrealistic calls for sexual abstinence. I most humbly join the observation that today, 2011, even within the Catholic Church, private judgment is widespread on the use of artificial contraception. It is said that it, Italy has a very low birth rate, even though some 80% of the population claim to be Catholic. The Italian example is one illustration that one strand of Christian ethics acknowledges the supremacy of the individual Christian conscience even over official church teaching. My last subtopic, the lesson from the Catholic past. Today, the scientific community and society in general consider that science and religion are fully independent of each other. I am one of the optimistic Catholics who do not subscribe to the so-called conflict theses. I do not believe that there is an intrinsic in effect, intellectual conflict between the church and science. But I am acutely aware that history gives us many examples of the conflict thesis and how wrong the church was. One example was the case of Copernicus, who was denounced by the church in the 16th century for publishing a new cosmology. Copernicus announced that the sun occupied the central place in the universe and that the earth moves around the sun. He was made to suffer for his conviction. Another example was the case of Galileo, who was similarly denounced by the church in the 17th century. Galileo supported the heliocentric view of the universe. Galileo was tried by the Inquisition, found guilty of heresy, forced to recant, and spent the rest of his life under house arrest. However, after a study conducted by the Pontifical Council for Culture in 1992, Pope John Paul II acknowledged that the church had been wrong. Still another example was the case of the theory of evolution, which had to struggle against misguided opposition. Like the theories of Copernicus and Galileo, the theory of evolution is now accepted by the Catholic Church. The official position now is that faith and scientific findings regarding human evolution are not in conflict. To conclude this part of my speech on the RH Act, allow me to use the language of liberation theology. 
the word of God is mediated through the cries of the poor and the oppressed Filipinos. Faith is the historical praxis of liberation. Faith must always be directed toward the changing of the present social order. We have to participate in the struggle of the poor and the oppressed Filipino mother and child. Let us adopt the project of theological feminism by searching the tradition for what has contributed to female subjugation. Uncontrolled pregnancies is certainly one of them. Jesus himself was radically open to women. Jesus was a revolutionary who accepted women as equal and rejected any use of God to perpetuate patriarchal or hierarchical relationships. As legislators and as law-abiding citizens of our republic, we in the Senate are prohibited by the Equal Protection Clause from enforcing anti-female prejudice. The RH Act seeks to correct the fallacy of intrinsic female inferiority. Fathers of the church, like St. Augustine, saw woman as dominated by the body in comparison with man who stood for the predominance of the spirit. We have since discarded this archaic view. Upon his resurrection, Jesus appeared first to women, thus sending a message. It was, and still is, the message of responsible love. That is the end of my speech, Mr. President. So that I will not be accused of monopolizing the time of the chamber, I will now retire very meekly to my chair and wait for interpolation tomorrow, if any. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Santiago. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I move to suspend consideration of Senate Bill 2865 under Committee Report Number 49. Any objection? There being none, motion is approved. With the permission of the Chamber, I move to transfer from the calendar of ordinary business to the calendar for special orders, Senate Bill 2857 under Committee Report Number 46. Is there any objection? There being none, motion is approved. I move to consider Senate Bill 2857 under Committee Report 46. Any objection? Hearing none, motion is approved. May we ask the Secretary to read the title of the measure, Ms. Berger? An act institutionalizing the participation of civil society organizations, CSOs, in the preparation and authorization process of the annual national budget, providing effective mechanisms, therefore, and for other purposes. Mr. President, to sponsor the measure, may we ask the Chairman of the Committee on Finance to be recognized, Senator Franklin Drillon. Senator Drillon is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, we wish to manifest for the record that the Committee Report, uh, committee report Number 46, which reports out Senate Bill Number 2857, also takes into consideration Senate Bill 2782, entitled An Act Institutionalizing the Active Participation of Bona Fide People's Organization and Non-Government Organizations in the Annual National Budget Hearings in Congress and the Budget Deliberations in Local Government Units and Providing Effective Mechanisms Therefore, close quote, authored by Senator Panfilo Lacson, which was referred to the Committee on Finance on May 9, 2011. We likewise manifest for the record that Senators Lacson and Ligarda be made co-authors of substitute bill number 2857 under committee report number 46. So move, uh, Mr. President. Any objection? Hearing none, motion is approved. Mr. President, distinguished colleagues, is good afternoon. Undoubtedly, civil society and people's organizations play a pivotal role in building